A whole new season of the GT4 European Series powered by Rafa Racing Club is about to get underway at a sunny Port Ricard. Welcome to the first of two 60-minute races. One today, one tomorrow morning. It is, as you kind of expect from the GT4 European Series, a stellar entry, huge grid assembled once again. Uh, the race will have mandatory pit stops and driver changes and a whole load of action. David Addison and GT4 European Series champion Charlie Fagg trackside. Uh, the pit lane has emptied the cars making their way round to the grid. Charlie, this is going to be good fun, isn't it? It's, a, like I say, a big, big entry, some star names, and the start of a whole new season, there's no real form guide. Exactly, yeah, really exciting start. We were just saying before how exciting the GT4 series is as a whole, mm. let alone with 49 cars about to hurl into turn one <laughs> in about 15 minutes' time. So really excited just to see who, who comes out on top. As much as we always say, you know, you've got to finish the season strong, you've got to pick up the points, it's just as key at the start. You've got to have a good start to the season. It sets the tone. Not only that, but it always makes you feel as a driver a bit more cool, a bit more calm after the first round. Okay, we've got that one done. Now we can start to crack on. Now we can be a bit more aggressive. But if you have a bad first round, you always feel like you're playing catch up. So it is important. True enough. Lots of points on the board as the race officials just discuss with the drivers on the grid, including the man that's on pole position, Enzo Juliet, just taking off his crash helmet, but he's the man that starts on pole position in the uh, Toyota Gazoo Racing France Toyota Supra. Enzo Juliet uh, sharing with Etienne Shelley, both quick drivers, so that's certainly going to be a, a car to watch, and it's going to be the McLaren run by Elite Motorsport with entire race one. Josh Ratican starting that will be alongside on the front of the grid, but it's going to be a really crowded house going into the first S's, isn't it? That first left-right flick, and keeping out of trouble there is absolutely key, but uh, we'll uh, come to that in a few moments' time, because once the cars have been released, we've got the formation lap, and then uh, they'll all plough into turn one. Uh, number nine, Toyota, then, as I say, is on pole position. Down on the grid is Antonia Rankin, uh, and she's going to try and grab one or two of the drivers before we get going. And one of those is Enzo Julier, the pole position man, right now. Right, pole position for first race of the season. That's never the worst, is it? Yeah, for sure. Um, nothing bad. I think uh, we cannot do nothing best. Uh, well, super happy to be here, back for the first race of the season. And to be on pole is uh, also amazing. So I'm looking forward to it. What's your strategy going to be for making sure you maintain this lead? Well, there's no, there's no strategy. I mean, uh, we will try to to be focused and to, to lead all the race. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's it. <laughs> no more strategy. <laughs> well, best of luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Charlie, let's just get this turn one conversation done. Uh, 49 cars and S's. It's, it's going to be Larry. It is. And I'll, uh, I know I got the bet wrong with Jamie Day being on pole. But I'll <laughs> put some more money down and say, I reckon at least 40% of the grid will cut the first corner. Um, it's a great way of already sort of Look, you can never plan a race start, and that's that's for sure. It's probably one of the things I'd say I'm most certain about. But you can always plan a bit of a contingency. So, look, if there's going to be a spin at turn one or you're a bit further back, you can always use that as an escape. Obviously, you shouldn't gain any places. You can't do that, so you have to slot back in. But it's a little bit of a nicer way just to feel like, OK, I've got a bit of a plan if it all goes wrong, and I can cut that. So getting through turn one and two is going to be very tricky, but so is three, four, five, yeah. six, and all the rest of them, to be honest. So that first lap is going to be is going to be mayhem. I think once they get out of turn six and seven, get on the straight, hopefully then it should calm down. But those first few corners are, yeah, are yeah. super tight around here. And we talk about these as a, a, a one-hour race, and yes, there are pit stops, but to call it an endurance race is a, a kind of misnomer. It's a, a flat-out sprint for 60 minutes. It is, yeah. I mean, I you know, even when you do the Spa 24 hours and GT3, it feels like a sprint race. 24 yeah. uh, sprint races so you know uh, the, the, the word endurance racing in GTs I think is getting a, a bit dying now because the modern day GT car and racer is just flat out now yeah, which is yeah. great to see for us guys um, and everybody watching it as well but yeah you're right nowadays you're just going to be absolutely qualifying lap after qualifying lap trying to progress and get as big a lead as you can do one of the race officials, William Water, there, just talking to uh, the uh, two drivers on the front to remind them when the pace car peels in, how they control the start. The five-minute board now being shown. One of the changes for SRO GT racing this year is that you can only do one lap round to the grid. In the past, the pit lane would remain open and you could do maybe two or three insulation laps. Now you can't. You've got to go straight to the grid. Uh, so anybody that uh, forgot that ends up being trapped in the pit lane. So the uh, leading car leaves the grid at the five-minute board and heads around the circuit. The pace car for the rolling start will stay there and uh, down on the grid. 
let's, uh, before we go racing here, from runner-up in the championship last year, Benjamin Larish on the grid with Antonia. So starting a little bit further back today, what are you going to do to make sure you're ending up near the front? So, <laughs> yeah, sorry, my English is very bad, so I need to... to uh, today is, uh, is, uh, is the race day. Uh, you, have, you have the speed from the, um, on the qualifying, you have the speed on the, on the, on the free practice. Now uh, I cross the finger to have the speed on the, with the tire for all the, all the race because the race is long and I don't know how the, the tire uh, finish for the race. Brilliant, thank you very much. Yeah. Bonjour Larry shares with uh, Robert Consani and uh, Bonjour very experienced uh, driver and Robert Consani is uh, a former rally driver turned French GT racer others already strapped in the car good to go and temperatures very pleasant for the fans but drivers strapped into the cars getting hotter and hotter wanting to get going wanting some airflow I guess Absolutely, yeah. A different one from a Vignes. Yeah, I've never seen the wrist movement to warm the wrists up before, but there you go. So he's obviously expecting to get his elbows out into turn one. <laughs> so that'll be exciting. But yeah, like you say, you get those, uh, both the doors open to try and get some airflow in as much as he can. But it's really that heat soak. When you drive to the grid, you think, OK, I've got all the airflow coming in really nicely. As soon as you get to the grid, it feels like, oh, I'm sat in a sauna here. So you just want to get going as quick as possible. Not only that, but the nerves, the, the anticipation of the race is coming in. The heart rate's starting to get a bit more. Your, your, your palms are getting a bit more sweaty. So everything's starting to heighten. So it just becomes a bit of a build-up and build-up. That's why it's important to stay cool, have a chat with your number one mechanic, and then get going. And we will be short because we're into these final five minutes as the... Uh Teams are confident, some of them are confident anyway. There's your front row of the grid. Uh, pole position is on the far side as you look at it, which is the inside line for turn one, that first left. So that's where the Toyota is of Enzo Julier and Josh Ratican lining up alongside in the Elite Motorsport McLaren. And that is a very busy GT4 grid stretching all the way towards Virage Dupont with a real uh, mix of brands as well, not just Toyota and McLaren that you've got at the front. There's Audi, there's Porsche, there's Aston Martin, uh, BMW. Mercedes represented on the grid, uh, there's Alpine, uh, Ford Mustangs are there as well, I'm bound to have missed one, but it gives you an idea of just uh, how popular these days GT4 racing is, and this championship has been just ultra competitive, hasn't it, for the last five seasons or so? Yeah, it certainly has, I mean, I've been lucky enough to be a part of it, uh, racing myself, it's been yeah. an absolute fantastic championship, such a great stepping stone to hopefully go into GT3 for a lot of these guys, if not, it's just a great championship to keep progressing in and, and racing, like you say, we've had probably grids of 40 plus for the last however many years yeah, yeah. you know since i've been doing it so it is great and uh and it's also great for lots of different categories it's very rare do you get a a, a massive grid in one of the categories and very small it seems to have evened out quite a lot through the silvers the pro and the am category so yeah it's very nice you you can have a, a battle seems to be up and down the field sure. all over the all over the place yeah it's a valid point that everyone has something to race for don't they e even if you're two ams there's still a, a, a championship for you to win you know you, you might not be as quick as the silver silver drivers but you've got your own uh, competition to try to aim for door up on the mclaren trying to get some cool air for josh ratican uh, who might not know paul ricard as well as enzo julier alongside him nor etienne shelley who will take over that car but uh, he is still uh, a very rapid driver as evinced earlier on in the day for qualifying. Right, the one-minute board is shown. Engines fire up. Mechanics leave the grid. Doors are closed. The drivers now left to their own devices, to their own thoughts, and plan the start of their race. The uh, fans in the grandstand getting ready for uh, the first hour of the GT4 European Series, powered by Rafa Racing Club season. The Rafa Racing Club element is Rafael Martinez, uh, who shares with John Lancaster, new to GT4 racing this year. Now, we have a BMW, as you can see, parked by the side of the grid... And that shouldn't be there. No, definitely not. If it is, it's a weird strategy from them. But no, <laughs> yeah. absolutely doesn't need to be that. I wonder if we're going to get an aborted start for this one. So let's, uh, let's wait and see what they do with this car. Unless the car's going to be uh, suddenly swung across the road and pushed into the pit lane, because there is a, a, a access gate. It might be that if the car does have a problem, they can release the grid, clear that, just go straight across, and then the road will be clear for the rolling start. But we'll see whether uh, the BM is able to move. Right, green flag shown then. So the cars accelerate away. <coughs> Not the start of the race, but the final installation of that to get some warmth into the Pirelli tyres and indeed into the brakes before we go racing. And the field accelerates off down towards uh, turn one with Enzo Julier at the front of the grid. And this is how they line up. It is Enzo Julier and Josh Ratic, and then on the front row ahead of Hugo Sasser and Stanislav Safronov on row two. Row three is Luki Baniev lining up alongside 
uh, Bonjouan La Riche. Then you've got Ruben Del Sartre and newcomer to the championship, Herolind Loredini, next on the grid. Nelson Panciatici shares row five with Tom Ensom. Then Oscar Christensen has Finn Zulauf alongside another newcomer to the championship ahead of Denis Bulatov and uh, Cameron Lawrence next. Then Benjamin Lesen and Gabriela Yilkova in the all-female crew in the Matmut Toyota. Next up, Ivan Ekocic lining up alongside John Lancaster. He's going to be one to watch off the starter, would have thought. Paul Petit and Fabio Rauer come next ahead of Lawrence uh, Lequertua and Emil Weraus. Next up, it is Matteo Villagomez and Victor Bouveng on the 12th row. The 13th row, Pascal Huto and Julien Richet. Florian Grizo is next in number 72, Aston. And David Kuhlman, new to the championship, lines up alongside him. Lonnie Martins and Eric Evans, last year's GT4 champion in British GT, come next ahead of Nick Malloy and Jagish Gerdix, BMW, a long way back. But ahead of the sister car of Beke Beschler, uh, Rick uh, Bautuorn is next with Gustavo Xavier and Baudouin Detou next on the grid. Then you get to Andy Cantu and Max Bird in one of the uh, Mahiki Racing Lotuses. Uh, Adrian Pavio shares the 20th row with Vasily Vladikin ahead of Christopher Brunhagen and Davide Meloni. Meloni Jr. in that car. Greg Gilbert, quite a long way back, 22nd row, alongside Mathieu Casalonga. Max Olsen is next with Jordan Carriage, uh, new, to pretty, new to GT4 European Series, ahead of Will Moore and Julien Ripper, with the last driver on the grid being Florian Brichet. That is how they line up. It is, as I say, a monster grid. I don't expect them to finish in that order. There's bound to be a whole load of shuffling as the cars then now turn their way out of the chicane that breaks up the Mistral straight. Is that the Melo... No, it's the Greg Gilver BMW, is it not? Number 317 that's had the problem. It has been pushed into the pit lane. If it can start, it will start from the pits. But Greg Gilver, very quick driver, regular Pro-Am champion, Peugeot champion many years ago, race winner. But... That's not the ideal start to the season, to say the least. Certainly not, no. But going back to the uh, front two, and obviously, as you're Enzo Julie, you've got the, the the inside line into turn one, which is obviously the optimal line. But I wouldn't I wouldn't count now Josh Ratskin to try and get round the outside into one, because with the outside into one becomes the inside into two. So that's my feeling for, for the first corner. If he can get a good runoff, I can't imagine Josh wouldn't try to go for that first corner and try and get to first place. It's going to be well worth watching, isn't it? It's going to be lively. And John Lancaster, with so much experience inside that crash helmet, he'll be perhaps able to use all of that to his advantage and work out where the road's going to open up, nip around any dramas that are ahead of him. Number 17, BMW, uh, another car to watch because that which is shared by uh, Benjamin Lassen and Ricardo van der Ender uh, will be another car pitching for a win. I would have thought Ricardo van der Ender and Benjamin Lassen did take a race win at Spa last year. John Lancaster will give this car over to Rafa Martinez for the second stint, and then it's the other way around for tomorrow. The start driver today is the finishing driver tomorrow. So now, after the instructions given on the grid, everybody gets themselves in that Noah's Ark two by two rolling start formation coming up towards the end of the lap when the pace car, as it is, peels into the pit lane. It will be to Enzo Julier and uh, then Josh Rattigan to control the pace up towards the lights and when they change uh, we are in business pit window is 25 to 35 minutes of the race duration and the pit stop line to line is 88 seconds get it wrong penalties come uh, take too long in the pits you penalize yourself and there uh, alex denning and tom levin uh, have to wait for their car uh, this is the nerve-wracking bit not driving it but watching somebody else drive your car so up towards the uh, virage de la tour comes the pace car, that will go for the pit lane. There's then the very tight Virage Dupont to get the cars onto the pit straight. And then 2024 for GT4 European Series, powered by Rafa Racing Club, is going to be underway. It's Toyota and uh, McLaren on the front row. It is Aston Martins on the second row with uh, Hugo Sass lining up alongside Stanislav, Stanislav Savronov. The lights are on red at the moment. When they blink green, then we will be in business to get the GT4 European Series underway. The cars accelerate up towards the lights, which are about to change. They do so now. And one or two from the background dive out, then to try to make ground up on the run towards turn one. But a great start by Julien, the Toyota lead and Hugo Sasser on the inside line tries to outbreak Josh Rattigan can he do so breaks as late as he possibly can into turn one and Rattigan gets run out wide all over the curb and there you see cars do cut cars do contact each other there's a spinning car off the road another one is handicapped and delayed as well eventually others rejoin the racetrack right Charlie you won that bet lots of them off the road 
Yeah, exactly. Finally, nice to win one. Uh, but <laughs> what a great start from Enzo Juli. I mean, look at him. Already got probably a, a second, second and a half gap between the car behind. Ratican just a little bit sluggish getting off, off the start there. And, and you can already see now straight away into a battle. This is just great for Enzo Juli out front now. He can get a gap. He can try and relax whilst everybody else is squabbling. So it'd be really interesting to see if he's got the pace. He had a three-tenths gap from pole to second place of Ratican in qualifying today. I wonder if he's still got that in the bag when it comes to the race. It's all getting a bit leery further back, isn't it? As one or two drivers explore the curbs coming out of turn six onto the Mistral. This BMW number 12 is from the Borisan Automotive team. It is Berke Bessler at the wheel of it at the moment. And they're all heavy braking now up towards the chicane. And did I just see a safety car light coming on the gantry there? The cars wriggle their way now up towards the right of scene. We haven't got safety car graphics, safety car legends, but we have got the boards and flags waving out of the window. So, ah, there is one of the reasons. 33 is not going very far with three wheels on it. That is Laurence uh, Lequertu as Alpine, the reigning Alpine Cup champion. So we are behind the safety car. It's not yet come up on the graphics, on the timing screen, but we are under safety car conditions. Uh, perhaps no surprise given 49 cars into that first pinch point as we were discussing pre-race. Exactly, yeah. Such a shame as well. Uh, started so middle of the pack, but that is the problem. You find yourself in that mid-pack in GT4, and sometimes you almost rather be further back so you can try and avoid all the carnage. But yeah, it was uh, it was likely to happen as there's such a pinch point into turn one. And when you get the cars trying to cut it as well, it's always natural that these cars have that sort of really tightens up and then you just can't go anywhere. So obviously, hopefully we'll get a bit of a replay, but uh, <laughs> that wheel's seen it better days. And Hasn't it ever? That Marshall struggle to get that back to the exit. <laughs> bits of suspension componentry still attached to it, but it's not attached to the car, which is where it should have been. So that's at least one Alpine gone. And Greg Gilvar has not yet started. And I think the other car that's missing is the 131 uh, Porsche of uh, Casalonga that got a grid drop anyway, Matthew Casalonga. I don't think that car uh, actually took the start of the race. There is Rafael Martinez looking on for the pit bunker and thinking, rats or words to that effect. John Lancaster now has less time in real terms to make up ground for me before I take the car over. He does, yeah, but he's also gained a lot, a lot of places. He's up to P11 now, which is a great job from him. A bit like what you were saying before, has he got that experience to try and weave him say, his, his way through the middle and through the carnage? He's obviously done a good job so far, and even though he got the curse of the camera car, he's doing a good <laughs> job at the moment, so fingers crossed I haven't uh, jinxed him here. Oh, I think you'll be all right. Uh, what about Becky Bessler's BMW? In contrast, that car is uh, trying to make up ground as well as the broken wheel is retrieved. Becky Bessler, 28. The BMW's really struggling. Bearing in mind that's the car that took Gabriele Piana and uh, Michal Schrei to the championship last year. Different team, I'll grant you, but the same base car. But the Turkish team, Borisan Automotive Motorsport, 27th and 28th. That is John Lancaster, of whom we were talking a moment ago. And here the drone, very nearly, was in the lead of the race there, but it's just been overtaken, coming onto the Mistral straight. Great shot, that, as you look down from the drone. Lights on top of the safety car. Right, so drivers have to sit there, obviously, and go through this whole process. What, if anything, can you do? Uh, and also, before we address that, let's have another look at this drama, Charlie, at the start of the race, and try and work out exactly what triggered it. But when you've got them five wide in the mid-pack, I suppose something had to give, didn't it? It certainly does, yeah. It looks like, actually, the uh, is that an elite motorsport? McLaren that gets turned round, which You're then right. sort of becomes the, the starting point to then the Alpine getting spun round. And that's where it seems to have all just happened. Sometimes you're trying to avoid a contact, and then you become the contact. Yeah. Tom Empson, you're right. He was 10th on the grid, and he's 44th. This is how John Lancaster saw it. Now, does he actually have to skip round the outside, or does he stay on the racetrack? We need to go into the back of somebody. And, yeah, he just runs out of road. So that got him away from the dramas, back onto the circuit. Yeah, he'll no say, I couldn't do anything more to the race director. I had to leave whilst everyone else will be going. He overtook us all off track. So a bit of a, you know, one of those things, first corner racing yeah. things. Obviously, John with his, I'll, I don't say many, many years of experience, or else he'll tell me that I'm calling him old. But <laughs> I will say, his plenty of years of experience will have taught him, you know, I'll have that plan in the back of my mind. So cool. if something goes wrong, I can cut this. And to be fair, he gave a few positions back, but I'll tell you what, he'll be very happy being close to that top 10. 
Indeed so. Right, at, at this part of the race, frustration for the drivers because they're not racing. W what, if anything, can they do while they're just sat in, uh, sat in, the, in the queue like this? Well, it looks like we're just about to go green at the end of this lap, so we've tried to get as much temperature into the brakes and the tyres as hard as possible. Been working it nice and hard. The biggest loser, other than the people that were in the contact, was probably Enzo Giuli. He had a great start. He looked so, so fast. Now he's thinking, OK, I've done it once. I'm going to do it again. He's picking his spot, and boom, he's off already. He's gone, isn't he? Yeah. So that's coming into the penultimate corner, Vero de la Tour, and he has gone to try to get away from Josh Ratican. Uh, it's up to him to control the pace. He can decide when he accelerates. Once you commit, you've got to keep going. You can't go and slow, because that just creates mayhem behind, but he's away. And so Enzo Julien will lead now at the end of lap two, that brief safety car period. Through they come. Julien leads then. Second is Ratican. Hugo Sasser is third. Safranov fourth. Ibanyev is fifth. Del Sartre sixth. Panciatici seventh. Bulatov is eighth. Larish ninth. And Nuradini tenth. And yeah, Julien has done it again, hasn't he? Because he's broken clear as there on the inside line. Look, Bonjamin Larish tries to get past Dennis Bulatov and gets his nose chopped off almost there. Bulatov says, oh, no, you don't. Mercedes comes across and defends the place. Yeah, it's super tight through turn one there. It's, again, we've got that horrible little pinch point, as you can see, around the outside, but just can't make it happen. Be interesting now to see if Ratkin can hold off between Sasser behind because I think he just doesn't look like he's got the straight line speed at the moment, but he can't afford to give any positions back. We briefly had a yellow flag in sector three, uh, but that's now gone in, so the road is clear for the leaders at the end of the lap. Enzo Julier trying to get away. Look, absolute best in the first sector, uh, so he is trying to do. Uh, charge clear of Josh Ratican, who in turn wants to try to stay with him and get away from Hugo Sasser as the cars accelerate then onto the Mistral Strait. We've got the silver, we have got the uh, bronze, and we've got the Pro Am battles going on in this race. As through the chicane on the Mistral, Julier, with his track knowledge, tries to make good his escape, and it seems to be working for him. Nobody being overly heroic yet coming into the chicane, where again we've seen incidents before people over the course of the day in many, many seasons. So Porsches go through en masse, but it's the Toyota leading and looking ideal for this circuit, stretching its legs. Look, looks great, yeah, it looks really good at the moment. It looks like from the speed traps, it's got great straight line speed, fast through the sectors as well. So for him at the moment, it's just a case of Enzo, Enzo Juli. Don't take too much out the tire now. Don't overstress the car. Just be nice and smooth and try and build a gap because it's so hard being the P2 man where you can just see that P1 car just starting to go away, away, ever so slightly. If it's a few tenths a lap, it's just a bit demoralizing. You're thinking, I can't get this back. And then you start to get caught by the car behind and it all just starts to tumble down. And there you can see number 90 Toyota muscling its way through. Emil Werage goes through on the inside then, or does he, to try to get past Julien Brichet. The Supra, yep, goes through then. Double Scandinavian champion, Emil Werage. So he knows what he's doing, and he goes through on the inside line now down towards Virage Dupont. Enzo Julien Supra, in the meantime, leads the way, and the margin is up to 1.3 seconds after effectively one flying lap of the race, with, in second place, Josh Ratican, Hugo Sasser third, and he's under attack, isn't he, now, from Stanislav Sofranov fourth there, this time making it work on the inside. Bonjamin Larish goes ahead of Denis Bulatov. He had a look last time, but that lap it worked. Yeah, it's always interesting when you start to try and feel like, I know I can go for this move. Last lap, I didn't quite get it, but I know what the driver did a bit differently. And I think I've got one more lap now before he knows my moves, before he knows my intentions. I've got to go for it. And hopefully it allows him now to start to push on. So the plan has worked, but Bulatov tries to come back at him, coming out of five, couldn't do it. Into Saint-Bohm, turn six, they go, and onto the Mistral, but that Audi, now we'll see whether it can start to edge away on the first half, if you like, of the Mistral straight up towards the chicane. A little bit further back in the queue, Luke Ibanez's Mercedes looking quick, that's just done the absolute best of anybody within the first sector, but look at the lead that Julier has got now. It was 1.3 seconds at the start of the lap, and it looks greater than that, as Josh Ratigan really is the best of the rest in second spot. He certainly is there, as you see, oh, the Aston just getting pushed a little bit wider, the Mirage car of Ruben Del Delsart. Really, really quick driver, Ruben, very experienced as well. Got a really good teammate in Josh Miller, but looks like if the Alpine's got enough straight line speed, I can't see Ruben being able to defend this coming into scene. Yeah, it is Nelson Panchitici, a very experienced sports car racer in the Alpine. On the inside line there, goes through, does it? Yes, Del Sartre slots in behind, possibly tries to get the undercut coming out of the corner, but Panchitici is wise to that and really defensive going down to Lebose. And look who's coming up behind the Borgerman Larich tries to go around the outside. Dennis Bulatov in the green and black Mercedes, he's right there as well. But Panchitici has survived and comes out ahead. Good racing that. Yeah, I tell you what, he's done a very, very good job to stay ahead there. It's such an awkward corner, that one. Very long, two almost double apex long right-handers. So super easy just to send a car down the inside if you're the one trying to attack. So he's done a very good job to 
be able to defend all the cars there because I had no idea who was going to come out in front there. <laughs> but the good news is they all came out. So uh, Ruben Del Sartre, like many on this grid, came out of the School of Hard Knocks, a.k.a. the Ginetta Junior Championship. Uh, Bonjamin Larish there just being able to fend off Denis Bulatov, who tried to get his nose back up the inside. So this battle pack heads to the line. Enzo Julien clear now by 1.6 seconds from Josh Raskin. And look at this, a whole line of cars coming over the line. This is sixth um, and everybody. Uh, Ford Mustang rejoining look, coming back onto the circuit. That's Will Moore after a pit stop, possibly caught up in the dramas at the start of the race. So now that car is out of sequence, getting involved in the kind of midfield train. But yeah, Nelson Panciatici with some brave driving there has managed to get ahead of the Aston and sixth place overall. He's not done yet, still charging. Certainly is, and I tell you what, you have to watch out for Benjamin Larish as well. He looks really quick. Great start from him. That Audi looks like it switched the tyres on really well. And actually, from a car that we didn't look like it was super fast in qualifying, it seems to have came its own in the race. That car, nice mid rear engine car, super great on traction, and hopefully for him, he can really utilise that and get great exits. But looks like it's not over yet with this battle, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Panciatici, Del Sart, Larish, Bulatov, uh, Nuradini a little bit further back, but trying to be part of it as they come down towards the chicane. Josh Ratican, though, now looking like he's kind of settling into a, a, a rhythm because he has just in the first sector taken the best part of three tenths out of Enzo Julia. He's done the absolute best work. John Lancaster to the curbs and lost a place out of all of that. The Supra goes through on the inside. So John Lancaster, who'd been looking good early on, gets run out wide. That was Gabriella Yilkova in the Supra that went by. Mm, John, explain yourself. Yeah, we've given too much air time to stay, so we'll, uh, yeah, but no, uh, to be fair, that Super looked like he had great speed, he looks really, really fast, and obviously Enzo Julie's proven that as he's in the lead, as we see Del Sarte on the inside now, so this is going to get really tight here, again, great, great defending from the Alpine there, he's doing a really good job to hold off. Absolutely, yeah, Nelson Pancia teach you with uh, pretty sharp elbows, he's got to stick them out to try to make sure that uh, he doesn't get mugged again by Ruben Del Sartre, who in turn now has got Bonjamin Larouche behind him, so Del Sartre in this invidious position of trying to attack and defend at the same time, the Audi has a tentative look to the inside coming out of Virage de la Tour to no avail. Now, what about a full send up the inside into Dupont? No, because there again, Nelson Panciatici is able to defend. The Alpine clearly good through the corners. What's it like in a straight line as Gabriella Yilkova goes way, way wide coming out of Virage Dupont? Nearly had to pay to get back in there, but she's back on the circuit. And actually, look, Panciatici has escaped because all of a sudden Del Sartre is on the defensive from La Riche in the Audi. Certainly is, and all the way around the outside through turn one. What a fantastic <laughs> move there. Absolutely brilliant. He's been the star of the show at the moment, making moves after moves. And I think he could be a real contender at the end of this race. I think you're right. I mean, there's huge amounts of experience there. Benjamin Larish, uh, who did for a time uh, drive in the MSV run, FIA Formula 2 Championship, when it was, what, early noughties, single-seaters. Uh, he's racing FIA GT1, Carrera Cup France. He's very, very experienced, and he's absolutely charging right now as the cars come through saint baume So, La Riche making good, good progress. Del Sartre dropping into the clutches of Denis Bulatov just a little bit. Yeah, he certainly is. This is so frustrating because Del Sartre looked like he was the aggressor not two minutes ago when he was just trying to push everybody through there. Panciatici looked like he was a bit faster than Panciatici. And now all of a sudden, he's been passed by Larish. Now he's looking like he's getting passed again. It's a horrible feeling when you think, I've got loads of pace, but I can't show it just because you get muscled out of one or two maybe moves, and then you just start to fall backwards. So out of the chicane they come. There is 81, the Cameron Lawrence-driven Rafa Racing Club McLaren that's accelerating up towards senior. Remember, we've got this pit window at 25 to 35 minutes of the race. Do Charlie teams tend to work out when they're going to make the stops, early or late in the window, or do they let the race kind of dictate it? You, you tend to always have a plan, and sometimes you just find that, especially for a Silver Silver, as that's what I was whenever I raced in it, but even more so as a Pro-Am, you always know, for example, the Pro-Ams, if the pros are starting, you'll keep them out as long as possible because they are quicker than the Ams. They'll get in as late in the window. For the Silvers, it's a little bit more even because both drivers are very similar. However, sometimes you might get one car that's in clearer air and you think, let's utilize this space. Other times you might think, we're in a massive gaggle. We need to box early to try and get some sort of space, hope for the outlap, and to try and undercut a couple of cars. So you always have a plan going into the race, but how often does that materialize is, yeah up to the engineers, really. Sure, and you never know what circumstances might uh, put a spanner in the works. If there's a drama before the pit window opens, and all of a sudden, then 
the team may decide to get you in early and uh, try not to lose too much time because it's better to pit under yellow than green. But thankfully, we are under green flag conditions. Uh, you've just been on board with John Lancaster, who's gone across the line in 13th place, trying to get the McLaren back ahead of that Toyota, which in turn of Gabriele Jokova is closing on Finn Zulaf's Cayman, which in turn is on the back of the Allied Racing uh, Herolind Nuredini Porsche. Those two Caymans absolutely together. And to the inside line looks Zulaf, but that was never really on, I don't think. Trying to force a mistake, though, out of Nuredini's Porsche ahead of him. Yeah, it's so hard as well. It looks up the inside. What a great move. Will the BMW follow it through as well? Or oh, Supra, sorry. Yes, I think he might just get up there. All oh, the curb. And again, another one of those things where you've got similar pace, you look good, but you just get bogged down by one car. Another one comes through, and this is just GT4 racing as a, <laughs> in an absolute nutshell where it can just go from bad to worse in the space of one or two corners. Tell you what, Gabriele Yilkova is a pretty feisty driver, isn't she? Because we saw what she did to John Lancaster. That was another big dive up on the inside coming through uh, turn five, and it worked. So the Toyota Supra gave another place that puts Gabriele Yokova up into 11th spot now and there are battles just about everywhere but that Supra the Matman car going nicely back on board with John Lancaster yeah you can just see hasn't quite got the straight line speed as he has from the Astons or the Supras in front but they have got good mid corner grip it's just really difficult to defend here because you have the long straights if you haven't got quite the straight line speed always always difficult to really try and fight back and challenge into Le Bose, John Lancaster, hugely experienced driver, turns the McLaren in, tighter line there, look, than the uh, Villar Gomez Aston ahead of him, but that Aston has got past, in fact, on this lap, so John Lancaster is now trying to get the spot back again, but uh, the Aston Martin of Matteo Villar Gomez keeping him at bay. This is one of the beauties of GT4 racing, and it's why the BOP works so well, that you've got all these different, if you like, shapes and sizes and configuration of car, and they are all so evenly matched. It's great. It is so good. You know, I've uh, been there myself where you just feel like, well, I'm faster here, but I'm a bit slower here. But on the lap time, we're doing the exact same yeah. thing as we can see all the way down the field here. Everybody's split, especially within the top three or four, within that sort of one to two tenths gap. So it seems like it's all settled down at the front a bit more now. Julie hasn't really gapped much more than 1.5 seconds. Sasa very close to Ratican behind. But it'll be interesting now because we saw in qualifying that Ratican has actually got a lot more pace in that car than we might think. Yeah, Josh Ratican's done the fastest lap of the race and is hustling on. Right, so is John Lancaster, who is um, down in 14th place now, and he's determined to try to fight back. So one McLaren going nicely up front. John's McLaren suffering a little bit, but he's so, so late on the brakes. Was he close enough to make a move? You can just see the battle in the background going down towards turn five. And no, he wasn't able to make a move as up the Mistral straight comes Enzo Julier, Josh Ratican, and their look in sixth place. Nelson Panchi Tichi uh, with the redoubtable Benjamin Lariche hustling on. Lariche means business, doesn't he? He's got the headlights on. That's always a good sign. Yeah, he certainly does. As soon as you're flashing, you've got to be passing. That's what I always say. <laughs> there you and go. I haven't just made that up now. Uh, but yeah, he looks fast. We've said it all. All, all race he's looked really really good and for the for the first 20 minutes he seemed to be the aggressor for the whole sort of uh, race at the moment so I think that he could be really one to, to keep pushing he's not really that far behind the whole pack he only nine seconds behind it sounds like a lot but if he could just clear this car and get it going then I think he could come back actually here comes Lariche look on the inside of the Alpine couldn't quite do it. Uh, so that car that was sixth on the grid, remember, fell back at the start, got caught up in all the fun and games, I think, at the first corner. So uh, here, Benjamin Lariche having to regroup, but he is regrouping. He's on the back of Nelson Panchitici, the Alpine versus the Audi then. Nose to tail, they run behind his Ruben Del Sarte in eighth place. And Benjamin Lariche, who knows this circuit well from GT4 European Series, he knows it well from French GT, which runs purely to GT4 regulations. So he knows, and so in fairness, does Nelson Panchi teach you know his way around here. But uh, Lariche hoping to put all of that experience to good use. Down they come to Virage Dupont. If you're really brave and late on the brakes, it's sometimes a chance, but Lariche not able to take advantage this time. Yeah, again, it's that horrible sort of pinch point where you're like, oh, I've got a big gap here, and then all of a sudden that gap comes to an absolute <laughs> uh, shut door. So you can't really force the issue through there if you're really far back, only if you're super close and you've got a bit of a speed advantage. But again, as we've been saying the whole race, he looks faster and he looks like he's going to make a move as soon as he can because there's one thing he hasn't done today is he hasn't waited too long. Yeah, Benjamin Lariche 
trying to surprise Nelson Panchi, Tichy and dive bomb him if he possibly can. Uh, Benjamin Larish is not somebody that normally gets involved in incidents either, so you can expect when it does come to be a good clean pass. He's late on the brakes into four, isn't he? So he's on the tail. The Alpine goes a little bit wider. What about here? He wants the inside line. And can he get the undercut coming out of the corner? No. And now, look, LaRouche has got a little bit stuck behind Panchi Tichy. The danger for him here, I guess, is that Del Sart and Bulatov are closing back up onto him. And if he has to defend, then it becomes a different battle altogether. Of course, yeah. And in his in the back of his mind, he'll be thinking, oh, I started further up, and now I'm back here trying to fight my way through. And this goes back to what we're saying in qualifying. Of course, you always want to be at the front, but this just goes to show, you might even find that some of the guys in the top five haven't quite got the pace. But here you see, what a fantastic move up the inside. Absolutely textbook from LaRiche there and absolutely perfect. Hopefully now he can get through and just get on with his race now and try and catch the front five. And of course there is the pit window looming, so that could shuffle the order as well. You never know what dramas there might be in the second part of the race to close the gap. So uh, the number three Audi effectively 10 seconds away from the lead. But another safety car would close all of that up. And look at the way that LaRiche is escaping. I'll grant you that Panchi Tichi is having to defend, and that's going to make him a little bit slower. But that out is now away and gone, isn't it? Yeah, he looks really, really quick. It'll be really interesting now. I'll keep everybody updated on the sector times just to see if he can start to crawl back a little bit from the cars ahead. Look, in the space of another 10 minutes, he's not going to be able to catch the front five unless we have a safety car. But he can certainly make some inroads now. He's got clear space. He's now can relax, nice deep breath, and now just do the lap times. Sure. And as if it's a qualifying session. He's done a great job to get back to where he started, though. On this lap, LaRiche has done an absolute best in the middle sector. So once released from behind the Alpine, it's game on. It certainly is, yeah. It'd be, it'd be really, really exciting now. I think we've got a, another little race on our hands. And, you know, even though he's sixth overall, he can still get some great points on the board here. True enough. Uh, in Pro-Am, it is Stanislav Sofronov leading. And we've got uh, Pro-Am, Am, and Silver. The leading Am is a long way back in 25th place, I think I'm right in saying, which is Pascal Huto. But the race leaders currently are on lap 10. And we've only got about three minutes before the window opens. And a big, big dive there. Look on the inside line. Denis Bulatov goes ahead of Ruben Del Sartre. That puts him up into eighth place. And Del Sartre fading a little bit. He's lost a, a fair few places over the course of his stint. Yeah, it looked really tricky, hasn't it, for the Aston at the moment? It's a shame. So I think let's go back to what we were saying before about where do you box the cars? Do you go a bit early or do you go a bit late? Josh Miller will be waiting in the pit lane going, I need to get in now. I need to show what I can do because I think I can drive that back. Whilst on the flip side, Ruben will be thinking, oh, I'll try my best to get back. I'll try to overtake this car, which I think he will do, to be fair to him. Yeah, he's got a toe. He's got the inside line. It's going to be the last of the late breakers to the chicane. On the inside line is Ruben Del Sartre. On the outside line, Dennis Bulatov. Del Sartre not quite clear, so Bulatov's got the inside line, and he's got the place back again. Del Sartre tries to get the undercut coming onto the straight up towards Senior, but Bulatov is able, I think, to defend. Del Sartre still lines up for a go on the inside. Two wheels over the white line, and as they come up towards Senior, time for a big, deep breath, turn in, together, and Del Sartre back through on the inside. Great racing. It certainly is, yeah, what a move. And now hard defending into Lobose, cut across the Mercedes here. He'll have to defend this nice and tight because that Mercedes isn't going to let this go easy. The only problem now for Ruben is, great, he's got the position back. He can now relax and try and keep going, but he's lost so much time to the car ahead. So, yes, he's got the position, but almost sometimes you think, and my best just to let that car go. If they are faster, try and follow them through because I've only got a few minutes until the pit window opens to get my teammate in, and hopefully we can have a great second half of the race. So the pit window will be open for the leaders at the end of the next lap as Ruben Del Sart, having said he was losing places, has managed to gain one back. So proof that he's not giving up. Bullet off to the outside line. He will then want to try to swing out of the corner alongside Del Sart, but he can't do it. Ruben, whose father, Rafael Del Sart, former racer in the UK, single seater, has got to Formula 3 level, came out of Formula 1st. But Ruben Del Sart starting his career in the UK in Ginetta Juniors, then into GT4, goes across the line. The pair of them look being caught by Finn Zulav in the sort of highlighter pen Porsche to the outside sideline it goes then dropping down towards uh, La Varriere the S's turns one and two but I think now Ruben Del Sartre out of the corner cleanly should be able to consolidate that Bulatov 
might have to think about defending from the Porsche. That's what Del Sart needs. Get the Bulatov Mercedes distracted. He can pull away. Yeah, he certainly does. But Bulatov looks so fast in this bit. This looks like where the Mercedes really comes into its own. Obviously, both front engine cars, both similar characteristics. But looks like Bulatov and the Mercedes just looks a little bit more agile. Yes, OK, he might not have the straight line speed, but through all these twisty and tight corners, looks like he can really start to gain some time on uh, Del Sart there. John Lancaster is being given a five-second penalty at the pit stop for leaving the track with an advantage. Uh, there are other penalties floating around for number 30. That is Finn Zulau's yellow nose Porsche. Five-second penalty at the pit stop, leaving the track with an advantage. So that's what we were seeing on board from the start of the race, and you were suggesting that John might be able to sort of plead innocence by saying, I couldn't do anything else. The officials have taken a different view. Yeah, I tell you what, as a driver, whenever something happens and you're in the car and you can't argue it, and I'd say <laughs> most race drivers are quite good arguers, or at least we think we are, <laughs> but at this point, you just have to crack on now. You've got the five-second penalty. The engineer will be coming over going, John, five-second penalty. you just got to deal with it. Now, in the background, just, it was briefly hidden behind the timing tower. It looked like there was a Cayman with a puncture, possibly, in the background, limping along the Mistral. So that is, yes, Nuradini's allied racing car that was up with the leading group earlier on, Herolind Nuradini, and a yellow flag has come out because I think the car has stopped in the middle sector. Uh, right then, we have now got the pit window open, as you can see on the graphic, Enzo Julier on his own. He is controlling the pace. He's clear up front and he comes up towards the timing line as you see Emil uh, Werash coming down the pit lane. Leaders go through. Enzo Julier has really, after the safety car at least, had a pretty easy stint, hasn't he? He's done a spot-on job. You know, sometimes you come out the stints and you think that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. A bit like what we've seen with Ruben Del Sart yeah. today. He's had to fight and fight and fight. Once you get people like Enzo Julie, who's just had a quick car, he's done a very good job. He's gone out front and he's thought, well, this has been quite nice, 30 minutes, just driving around Paul Ricard by myself, worst Saturdays, and to be honest, he's doing a really good job. Now, the pit lane's getting busy because Inners Campanchi Tichi, Becke Beschler is in. Uh, also, one or two more from the mid-pack come down the pit lane. Yagish Gerich is in, Paul Petit is in, and also in Fabio Rauer. So the order shuffles now, you get this slightly uh, distorted 10 minutes with people pitting on different laps and the order uh, shuffling markedly as they're the AM Cup leader. It is in the Schumacher CLRT Alpine, Pascal Huto, the CLRT bit being Comledegar Racing Team uh, and an amalgamation of two or three teams really to form this powerhouse and running lots of different types of brands in different GT categories, whether it's GT3 or GT4 over the season. So another Alpine going well in its own battle in class. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're starting to see, yeah, we've got the uh, elite motorsport car in there. So obviously they've opted for the early stop there, especially with some dramas that they had to start. They're going to try and get in early and just get some clear air, hopefully try and get some good laps in and hopefully try to res get some result at the end of this, especially in the silver class, which they can hopefully still get some points in. So that was Tom Emson who got caught up in the spin at the first corner, giving way to Alex Denning. Enzo Julier turning his way up towards the end of lap 12. And the Toyota, after a really good stint in Julier's hands, still ahead of Josh Ratica, only by a couple of seconds. It's not a massive advantage, but he's been able to maintain this thus far. And Julier is going to stay out for another lap. What about the McLaren? That stays out as well. And so does Hugo Sasa in third place. I suppose yeah. part of the decision when to pit as well is how crowded it might be around your pit box because you don't want to get hemmed in, do you? Absolutely, yeah. It was a bit like what we were saying in qualifying. It's not just the problem is getting into the pits, it's getting out. And because you park parallel in the race, it's a lot more tricky if you can, can't swing into your box or can't swing out. You've got a time pit stop as well, a minimum pit stop time. You have to be sat in there. You can see the, the 444 Audi here is ready to go, but they'll have to wait until the clock goes zero and then you can release any earlier. You get a pit stop penalty. Any later, you just lose unnecessary time. So even if you see a car come in, you can't box behind it because they might take still a minute to get going. Indeed, so the Audi you were just looking at was Julien Ripper giving way to uh, Philippe Talami. And you also saw briefly before that uh, Robert Consani leaning over the pit wall, urging on Benjamin Larich, who is still running in sixth place. So there's Alex Denning in the yellow McLaren having 
I'll tell you a lie. That is Josh Rattigan out of sequence now because you've got the Porsche a lap down ahead of it. Uh, so trying to make progress through the traffic and not lose out to the leader is Josh Rattigan. The gap actually down again last time, 1.6 seconds. The last lap was the best of the race by Josh Rattigan. And as I say, six tenths gained over the Super. That's a big, big chunk. Ah, it certainly is, but now it's all for nothing yeah. because he's stuck behind this Porsche and there's nothing worse and you just can't get through. Not necessarily saying the Porsche's doing anything wrong. It's still got their race to run here, but you just feel as the McLaren, oh, I've just done my best lap of the race. I feel like I'm catching, and now you get stuck. This will be interesting to see. If you can't get past, you have to box this lap. So the Porsche turns through. The Allied Racing Caymans are quick cars, as we saw last year. And now Josh Rattigan gets up on the inside and goes through. Kind of had to fight a little bit for that, didn't he? But he has done it. He's gone by, moves himself ahead of uh, Leo Pichler in 22 Porsche. So on that lap, he lost two tenths in the first sector, three tenths in the second. So uh, exactly as Charlie Fagg was saying, the time gained on the previous lap, all for nothing, because he's pretty much lost it all back again on the next one. It is, yeah, but it's good info for the team. It's good info for the drivers. OK, I lost out because of the traffic. But I tell you what, this car still looks alive. This car still looks good on the, on the older tyre. And now he's going to hand over to his teammate and he's going to say, look, here, we're in second place. I think we can get the win here because the tyre is just hanging on perfectly. It's a bit like what we saw from the Elite Motorsport guys in qualifying. They were doing their lap on lap eight right at the end until they got blocked there. So this car has got really good speed at the end of its tyre life. I think it could still be in the hunt for the race win here. Indeed so. Race leaders have gone by. Now Hugo Sasser bails from third place and to a pretty clear pit lane. So that could have been quite a good decision to bring the car in now. We are also having John Lancaster under investigation for overtaking on the blue part of the circuit. So he's got one penalty. Another one might be in the post here as the field streams over the line. This is John Lancaster, who is 11th on the road now. But of course, it's a shuffle order with one or two pitting. And John, with respect to Rafa Martinez, will stay out for as long as he can because he's the gun driver in that car. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's been a tricky little stint for John here. It just hasn't looked like he's had quite the pace. Then obviously the penalty for cutting the turn one and now he's under investigation again i'm not saying the curse of the camera cars came true but it certainly hasn't helped him at the moment you can just see he's going to try and work his way through still do a couple more laps then head over to his teammate rafa however it looks bad okay we're 14th 15th overall but we're still fifth in class yeah we're still not out of this and i tell you what it's a long season let's get some good points on the board and stay positive same is true of Josh Raskin. He's staying positive, isn't he? Because he's almost now pegged back Julier. 36-3 for both of them in the first sector of the lap. All right, by a few hundreds, uh, Julier was quicker than Josh Raskin, but Josh has certainly not given up. They're coming to the end of sector two now, and Josh quicker there as well. So having been delayed by the Porsche uh, involuntarily, uh, he is now charging along once again as the cars accelerate up towards Le Bose. A bit of a twitch there from the McLaren. Uh, proof, if you needed it, that Josh Raskin is leaving nothing on the table. Yeah, certainly. Gained a tenth through the second sector there. So little bits here and there, little bits here and there. But his teammate will be thinking, rubbing his hands, going, right, I'm going to have someone ahead of me that I can chase down. And it's always easier chasing than it is trying to drop someone, especially when you can just see if you're catching a little bit. That motivation just helps you to get a bit closer, a bit closer, and then eventually it comes down to who can overtake. Just quickly to mention, as in comes Josh Rattigan and Enzo Julier. So the top two in on the same lap. Just quickly to say that the AM leader from earlier on, Laurent Hergon, has now taken over from Pascal Hutto, but they're under investigation for being short on the pit stop time. You've got a, a one second tolerance that you can use as a joker uh, over the course of the weekend, but they're outside that. It was a second and a bit. So what was an AM lead early on might well unravel now as the car controllers start to uh, release, for example, Robert Consigny, and at Elite they await the arrival of Josh Rattigan. Out he gets, and into 78 then will hop Tom Levin. Some teams you'll find the outgoing driver, having done his stint, walks away. In others, the outgoing driver helps the incoming driver, straps them in and uh, offers advice. There's a, a, an example that for Luki Banyev, he's done, and it's the team that's going to strap into that car Alex Papadopoulos, but uh, Luki Banya then turns on his heels and goes back. Door shut, Rattigan's job done for the moment. It's always nice as well if you can get a driver to do it instead because you actually get a bit of motivation when they just go, the car feels great, go for it. Yeah. And you feel like, okay, the nerves have gone a bit. I actually feel a little bit like, right, I'm gonna go and do it now. And I guess you feel like you're part of a team, not two drivers in the same car. Exactly, yeah, yeah it just feels a great lot of motivation. I've had it before. Back in my early days of GT4, where I've been so nervous, we're in a great position, can I maybe win this race? You get in the car, the nerves are all just flowing through you, then your teammate goes, you've got this, and you think, 
oh, maybe I do. Yeah. And then you get in the car and you think, right, here we go, and I'm going to do a good job. It just fills you with a bit more confidence. It fills you with a bit more pride to think, yeah, I'm going to try and do everything I can for my teammate here. So the race leader now on to lap number 15. It's going to be a very, very shuffled order with some cars having pitted, others just now finishing the pit stops. So it's really at the end of the next lap we'll get a proper idea of where the leader is. They're going through on the inside is Robert Consigny. Back ahead look of Mercedes number 20. So that puts him ahead now of Lucas Meyer, who's taken over from Denis Bulatov. And that car drops back a further place, does it not? Because there through on the inside goes the Aston Martin so more and more shuffling carrying on constantly then looking quick and behind is that the Josh Miller Aston it is and he's taken over from Ruben Del Sar so this battle that we had before the pit stops same cars pretty much carrying on but the Aston back up with the Audi yes certainly and Josh Miller looking absolutely rapid as he comes out the pit lane there flashing the headlights he's letting them know and as we always said if you're flashing your passing, so let's go, Josh. Don't prove me wrong. Um, I've actually, I know Josh well. I've sat in the passenger seat of a Ginetta Junior with him when he was 15. We've been in the gravel at Turn 1 at Brands Hatch. So uh, <laughs> I've taught him all he knows. If he, as long as he does a good job, and if he doesn't, then I never sat with him at all. Yeah, if he does well, it's all down to you. And exactly. Not, uh, never heard of him. Right, there he is, a little bit sideways as in comes the power. But Josh Miller hustling on then as he comes now on to the rest of the Mistral straight, broken up by that chicane, just to curb the speed of these cars. Really, not so much the car themselves, but the, the, the number of AMs and relatively inexperienced drivers that we have. So for them to be approaching senior absolutely flat out, it's over a kilometre and a half long, that straight, uh, would perhaps be asking a little bit too much of them. So at the end of this lap, we'll get a proper idea of the order, but Robert Consigny, certainly, as you can see, under attack from Josh Miller, third in British GT's GT4 category, and the Audi perhaps now just settling a little bit. So he's edging, possibly, away from Josh Miller. But let's keep an eye on that gap come the end of the next lap. Etienne Shelley then takes over the Toyota Supra that leads the way. And it is Tom Levin in the McLaren that will do the chasing. So Etienne Shelley has gone over the line. And 3.9 seconds now is the margin. But Etienne Shelley was uh, eight tenths under the pit stop time. Tom Levin was half a second over. So you add that together. That's why the gap has partly grown. Yeah, it's a risky strategy from the Toyota. But I tell you what, it looks like it's paid off absolutely perfectly. We always used to say, look, don't risk it. Just try and be a little yeah. bit over. Get, get your job done. Don't get any investigations or any unnecessary penalties. But like you said, you have got that joker of the one second. So they've obviously used that very cleverly. And now it looks like that gap has just gone from what seemed like a couple seconds to double that. So the cars now pouring their way down towards turn four. Good little battle pack going on here, including the number 12 BMW, which has now got Gabriele Piana at the wheel, and he goes ahead of Max Kronberg on the inside line. And then Hendrik Steele, who shared with Max Kronberg last year, tries to go through, and he does. So Kronberg gets his hat nailed on there. Two places lost. And Gabriele Piana looks like the Gabriele Piana we know. He's overtaking. He's running a bit further up the order after a really tough qualifying. There was a BOP adjustment after qualifying. And look at this. Josh Miller right back on the tail for sixth place of Robert Consa who is oh so defensive up to the chicane you want to get past you're going to have to go the long way around Josh he says Josh Miller breaks late and almost runs out of road thinks better of it or does he he's got the inside line he's almost done it constantly forced out wide Josh Miller perhaps lets him go there rather than gaining the place and risk a penalty but that was hard racing it certainly was I actually feel a bit for Josh Miller there because it looked like he did all the hard work and then it's just that awkward again that pinch point and constantly has just gone wide you could argue if you were Josh Miller, you'd be on the radio going, he cut the track, he cut the track. Constantly would be going, well, I had nowhere to go. So it's that really, again, it's that fine line as a race director. I mean, who'd want to be a race director? Certainly not me. But <laughs> I tell you what, Josh Miller looks like he's the aggressor here. He looks like he's going to get past. It's just a case of when. True enough. Great fighting between these two. Etienne Shelley there, leading by 3.9 seconds and is quicker in the sectors than Tom Levin behind him with Raphael Renhofer up into third place now in number 99, the pro sport uh, car that he's taken over from Hugo Sass and the Aston Martin. Right, they come up towards the end of the lap. There's the leader, Etienne Shelley, continuing the good work from Enzo Julier. Second will be Tom Levin in the yellow McLaren in the background. But it doesn't look as though at the moment anyone's got an answer to this Supra. And in fairness, there are other Toyotas in the race, but the next one's down in 10th place. That, that particular car is just very, very impressive at the moment. Yeah, it certainly is. And it's so nice as well, especially for Enzo Julie. He's probably got out of the car, gave it to Shelley and gone, go for it. 
Yeah. And now he's just done exactly what Enzo did all those laps ago, where he's just built that gap to start with. And now, yes, it'll probably end up being a bit more manageable, but he's just done a great job as a teammate. You couldn't ask for anything more. True enough. Lots of flashing from one or two as they come across the line, including uh, Jean-Laurent Navarro in the grey Porsche there going into shot and diving up on the inside, number 55, Alpine. That's Laurent Hergon, who's got this Damocletian investigation for the pit stop time hanging over him. So uh, although that car is leading in AM at the moment, may not stay there. We'll have to wait and see. Dive down towards turn four. Laurent Hergon ahead of Kevin Jimenez, the former Clio racer. And then third in AM is the Sri Lankan, Dylan for Malagamua. That's Hergon for Schumacher CLRT, the Alpine in traffic, but he's not coming under attack from AM opposition at the moment. So he just needs to pick his battles, really, which I suppose is the hard part, trying to work out who you're racing against. Yeah, and sometimes you think, everyone just go away for a bit. Let's just do a few <laughs> lap times. Let's try and get some sort of clear air and catch the cars in front rather than just squabbling. You almost want to try and get a radio to the other car and just go, should we work together a bit? But you can see in the background, they're definitely not doing that. Yeah, three, four abreast almost down towards the chicane. There is the Matmut Toyota that's in 10th place. Now, remember when Gabriele Ilkova was driving that car earlier on, it was particularly feisty. Cindy Goode is behind the wheel of it at the moment. And again, it's going well. Uh, Cindy comes from uh, a rally background and ice racing uh, and six times French hill climb champion. And he's about to lose out, I think, because up to the inside, there goes Jamie Day. And he's done the job very, very well indeed. Winner at Alton Park in GT4 in British GT just under a week ago. Jamie Day through. And I think now Gabriele Piana, look, in that uh, turquoise BMW, is going to have a go at the Supra. Supra is on the same sort of floor plan as the BMW. And Piana gets run out wide. <laughs> Cindy Goude is certainly not for being overtaken, is she? No, absolutely not. Maybe she thinks she's back on the hill climbs there because <laughs> she was putting up a really good defence. But yeah, looked like Piana had the overlap there and was just going to do the classic one where you run wide into the last corner. But you can see now he's starting to lose the next position. That's Hendrik Still that's gone ahead of him. Hendrik switching from Porsche to Aston Martin this year. Couldn't do it by the end of the straight. So on the brakes, Gabriele Piana comes back on the inside line. But really, really good way to start the GT4 European Series season this with some great racing all the way through the field. And we ain't done yet. We have still got just over 18 and a half minutes. Yeah, it's so nice to watch real clean racing as well. And to be fair to the, all the guys here, apart from a bit of contact at the front, everybody's been really nice yeah. and respectful. Really good racing, especially for some of the younger guys here that are still learning the trade, still learning exactly how to race with these really fast, relatively fragile GT cars that can put up a fight, but they can also do it cleanly. Yeah, because in the past, we've had, with busy grids, quite messy races interrupted by, OK, yes, we have had a safety car period, but uh, sometimes on more than one uh, occasion in the same race, we've had interruptions. But here, yeah, good racing, clean racing, hard racing. And here comes Piana up the inside. But Goudet is trying to get past the Mercedes, and Piana gains two places. And the one that came off worse there was Lucas Meyer, forced up the escape road. Gabriele Piana is the one that benefits from three wide coming up towards the chicane. A <laughs> delight from the team. Yeah, I tell you what, I have to feel sorry a bit for Maya there because even though he's came out unscathed, he had to do the avoiding there. He actually did very well. He was very, very on it to be able to be aware enough to think, if I turn in here, I might cause an incident. So I'm going to cut the chicane and just go straight on. So Pianolo looks really, really fast, and it's great to see him back to where he usually is. Yeah, it is, isn't it? So that BMW looking a little bit more racy, which might give them some more optimism for tomorrow. Uh, won't affect their grid position, won't help them in terms of that. They'll still have to do the, the hard yards, but they're making progress. Right then, so as the race leader is on to lap number 19, uh, we've got 17 more minutes of the race to go. And here you can see an effort by on the inside line there. Uh, Robert Consigny goes through. I think that's putting a lap, isn't it, on... One of the Astons. No, he's gone ahead of Alexander Weintraub. So that was for position. Apologies. So Weintraub, uh, who is now falling back in the queue, had been gifted fifth place, but he's just dropped down to seventh as he comes over the line. Alexander Weintraub taking over from Stanislav Sofronov in number seven. And the pair of them in the Pro-Am category then drop a couple of places. Right, so Consigny is still on the move. Next target, Alex Papadopoulos, who's taken over from Luke Ibanyev. Yeah, but Weintraub's still in the lead of the Pro-Am category there, so he won't be too fussed about those silvers going past him. He's just thinking, nobody touched me, especially not my teammate. Just let me crack on with my race. You do yours. You can still see Josh Miller there all over Consigny. 
It's been actually a really good battle between these two. You can see the strengths, the different areas where the Aston Martin looks good and where the Audi looks fast. Let's have a look at this brave effort by Piana. And you've got to feel a little bit for Lucas Meyer because he was hung out to dry. He just couldn't turn in, could he? Because otherwise that'd have been a, a pretty big impact. Absolutely not. I feel for him in some ways because he had a little bit of contact, but then on the flip side, I don't at all because actually he just got away unscathed and actually set the fastest sector in sector three. So he's obviously doing all right because he just cut it through there. So he had nowhere to go. Like I said, very good awareness from him and he can hopefully keep going and that damage hopefully isn't too detrimental to their race. So fifth, Robert Consigny just got a shot. Sixth behind is Josh Miller, then Weintraub from Antoine Leclerc, Day and Lucas Meyer down to 10th place. Other battles are still to be resolved. Look, as another stream of cars here heads up towards the chicane. And same again, be brave on the inside line, although the Cayman there not really close enough to, to realistically make that move stick. So coming out of the chicane, Victor Bouveng, Jean-Laurent Navarro, Kevin Jimenez, Sasha Bottom, and Roberto Faria at the back of the queue. Remember this car? So far up the road, is it now? Nearly five seconds to the good. Etienne Shelley if he has got a radio to talk to the, the uh, team, might be saying, are there other people in the race? Because uh, there's a, a little yellow dot in the mirror, but they have just put together a superb effort here. Yeah, absolutely sterling effort from the guys there and the, with the Toyota. They've been so fast right from the outset. They're completely deserved leaders at the moment. It's really tricky, though. Whenever you want to look back at the races and you think, oh, to all your friends, go and watch me race, go and watch me race. And they go, well, I've never even seen you on TV. I mean, it's actually a nice thing in the end, but... You don't even get in, on, on board anything because you're five seconds in the lead. You're just in your own yeah. category. But what a great start from these guys. And these guys will be thinking, if we can do it in race one, can we do it tomorrow in race two? Uh, remember the AM situation we were touching on. Laurent Hergon with this penalty. Well, it's going to be an 11-second time penalty at the end of the race for a short pit stop. So Laurent Hergon leads in AM from Kevin Jimenez, Aston Martin. But there are two other cars out of Pro-Am between them. Uh, need to have a look at the gaps when they come across the line at the end of the lap they're on and see where 11 seconds might drop Hergon. I think it's going to cost him a class lead, but it's going to be touch and go. Uh, we'll uh, need to see what it is in another 14 minutes. It could be that Jimenez is able to close, in which case he would lose the lead. It could be that Hergon's able to stretch the gap, in which case he can preserve the class lead, even allowing for the penalty. That is the experienced Hendrick still in 11th place. And Gabriele Piana still hustling on in the BMW there that kind of towers over the Aston Martin of Jamie Day up the road ahead. Yeah, he's looking still very aggressive though, isn't he, Josh Miller? As he's just trying to do something here, but looks like, is that Antoine Leclerc that might have just got by there? I think you're right, yes. He did, got himself up past Weintraub and then also tries to get ahead of Jamie Day. So uh, Antoine Leclerc, perhaps one of the most experienced drivers on the grid, still pushing. That's constantly running in fifth place. So from sixth on the grid to fifth, you might think they've not really achieved very much, but it's been a hard race for them. Behind in sixth place now is Antoine Leclerc. You're quite right, Charlie. And then down to seventh drops Josh Miller. So again, that little Alpine, as it was in the hands of Nelson Panchitici, pressing on to good effect. Exactly. And again, this just goes to show back to my point before, you look like Josh Miller was absolute shoe in to get that overtake done on the Audi. But then again, it just happens where you get, obviously Leclerc's came from a little bit further back in the Alpine with absolute abundance of pace. But now he's got past Miller. Miller's dropped back from the Audi, which he looks so set to pass. This is always the tricky part. Your pace doesn't always show. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to make the moves as fast as you can, or else you can just tumble down the order. Indeed so. As the race leaders go by, that puts now 20 laps in the book. 12 and a half minutes are on the clock. So Etienne Shelley to Tom Levin, 4.8 seconds on that lap. There's only hundreds to choose, but still the Toyota the stronger of the two. Rafael Renhofer, uh, who is new to GT4 European Series, third, doing a good job. Alex Papadopoulos has taken over from Lucky Bagnef and his fourth. Robert Consonet in for Benjamin Larige, fifth. And Antoine Leclerc, who's taken over from Nelson Panchitici, sixth. There's a big, big dive there. Look on the inside. That, by the look of it, is Gabriele Piana getting himself up past Jamie Day. So Piana into ninth place, chipping forward. He's not giving up, despite uh, the BMW not having quite the pace he would have liked. Yeah, exactly. But for the silver category, considering where they started, they'll be thinking, OK, we're still going to get some points on the board. It won't be a pointless race one. So there's always positives to find in this thing. And what the good thing is, even though the BMWs as a whole brand haven't looked that fast so far today, they look like they've got some pace. OK, they might not have the absolute outright pace. Lapping in the 14.6s is their best, whilst the best lap time we've got is was Rattigan on the 13.3. So they haven't got the out and out pace, but it looks like they've got the average between each silver driver that they can still make some sort of result out this weekend. So Piana having cleared Jamie Day, trying to escape. 
And there the two Astons battle on because now it's going to be Hendrick still, isn't it, in the sort of orange-nosed car, the second of the Aston Martins, trying to find a way past Jamie Day. Aston Martins on the continent seem to be much more colourful than in the UK. Uh, but uh, there you've got another fight because, look, Antoine Leclerc getting himself onto the back of Robert Consigny. So that little Alpine, as we were saying in stint one, a very, very quick car. And Antoine Leclerc started the lap eight tenths back from Consigny. He may well end the lap ahead. Yeah, exactly. And just to give you guys an idea of the pace, his last lap was a 13.6. No one is even close to that. Oh, no, as we see the Aston gone wide there with the front left problem. Wheel hanging off, so that from third place is Raphael Renhofer, and that's game over. Disbelief from the team. Now, what's caused that? Is that a big, heavy kerb strike? The kerbs here are pretty low, aren't they? Strange one, yeah. It looks like there's no bodywork damage, so I can't see it or imagine it being any contact. I don't think he was close enough to level in front to really be able to have any contact, so maybe, like you say, these kerbs can be pretty vicious around here, but it seems strange to rip a wheel off like that. Yes, agreed. I mean, Redhofer is out. He's limping it back to the pit lane, but I suspect that's a breakage. And that is the Roberto Faria Aston out of 23rd place. All of a sudden, it's a bad lap for Aston Martins. Faria, I think, has just had a spin because he's hooked a gear and got going again now. Yellow lights will be extinguished. Uh, all of this happening now within the last 10 minutes. It's not over till it's over, is it? It certainly isn't. And like we said, even though it's just an hour, a lot can happen. But I'm gutted for Renhofer. He did such a good yeah. job. Mega in his qualifying session, did a brilliant job to keep in third there as well. Robert Consigny is not gutted for him because he's just gained a place and this fight now is on for fourth. But look, Antoine Leclerc didn't find a way past by the end of the lap, but not for the want of trying. They are all up the kerb there going through turn six, Sam Bohm heading up towards the Mistral straight now. This, lap 22, nose to tail. Audi, Robert Consigny, Alpine, Antoine Leclerc, who has been quicker over the last three laps. Look as they come up towards the chicane now. Yeah, you can just see, can't quite get close enough on the straights here, but you watch him close in. Again, that little Alpine, so fast, so nimble in those tight and twisty ones, whilst the cumbersome Audi looks a little bit more rigid, a little bit more, as you can see, oh, oh. down the inside, a little bit of contact there, but everybody remains unscathed, and hopefully no damage to that Audi. Considering Robert Consigny in the Audi came from rallying, where it's really only you uh, on a special stage, he sure knows how to defend. And in fairness then to Antoine Leclerc, he did self-censor, didn't he? He knew there was contact, so he didn't force the issue. And that's a very sorry sight of Raphael Renhofer's Aston out of the race. Right, Leclerc has another go at Consigny and closing back up on them as they delay themselves is Josh Miller. Is the door going to open on the inside? No, it's not. I think Leclerc there rather anticipated Consigny would run wide and give him the real estate, but it didn't turn out that way. And right there with them again now is Josh Miller. Yeah, this race has really heightened up as in the last couple of laps here. Consigny just hanging on there. He's defended well there pretty much all racing. He's defending from Miller well, and now obviously he's defending again from the Alpine, but I just can't see him be able to hold on for another four laps. Here they come then once again up through Virage de la Tour. The Alpine to the outside needs to switch to the inside, but in fairness to Leclerc, he's trying to attack Consigny. He's trying to defend from Josh Miller up towards the line they come. Eight more minutes on the clock. They're going to be side by side then as they come past the pits. The Audi on the inside loses out because on straight line performance alone, the Alpine goes through. So Antoine Leclerc up into fourth place, down to fifth is Consigny. Sixth is Josh Miller. Consigny thinks about attacking again, but he's got to go defensive and keep the Aston at bay now. He certainly has, yeah. What a brilliant switchback from the Alpine there. Just used all the grunt and go that they've got. And even though he didn't look like he had quite the pace on the straight line, that exit coming out of the last corner just catapulted him to be able to get past him on the straight. Indeed so. Right, a bit of a lock-up there. Look as Robert Consigny hustles on. So the changing fortunes of cars in this race is fascinating. It's not that one sort of goes up and up and up and up, some gain, and then lose places again as cars they've overtaken fight back. Really has been a, a fascinating race, this. Uh, and as Charlie made the point, good, clean racing. The occasional run between a couple of cars, but uh, nothing silly. And uh, looks like the championship is in for a good year. As there, Robert Consigny, GT4 expert, really. Been in it for a good number of seasons now. You can see how much time he's lost to the Alpine in the space of a lap, but he's now having to go defensive from Josh Miller. And by going defensive, that will cost him time. Of course, yeah. It's also maybe more psychologically as well. You've been defending for the best part of 10, 15 minutes, and now you think, right, I've now got to attack or else I'm going to be defending again. And you get in this vicious cycle where you just can't stop defending and you almost forget, <laughs> right, I need to get back on it. I need yeah. to get back doing a qualifying lap. It's not as easy as it just seems when you've been defending so hard to be like, okay, forget about that, let's go again. Well, certainly on the attack is Josh Miller, sixth, and Gabriele Piana in seventh place is attacking, but he's got five seconds to make up. 
Joseph's task wheel coming down towards Le Bose. Uh, Lucas Meyer is being given a five second penalty at the end of the race, uh, leaving the track and gaining an advantage. Well, that was when he couldn't turn in at the chicane, but you were right, he did go up the escape road and got away unscathed. And rather than slowing and letting cars go past, kind of gain the advantage that way. Yeah, it's such a tricky one, that one is. They'll definitely be disappointed with that decision, but I can understand where both people come from. The race director's thinking, you did gain an advantage. You had two cars up your side, but he'll be going, well, I couldn't do anything. If I turn in, we're gonna have a crash, we're gonna have a contact, so. Yeah, it's one of those things I would put down as a race and incident, but look, yeah. at least I don't have to make the decisions. And to add insult to injury, the car's lost pace anyway, and he's down in 16th, so uh, you could argue that it gone by anyway, but then you add the five seconds and the day just goes from bad to worse. Here, Max Kronberg's Porsche heading up towards the line, 13th overall, number 30 Porsche. The yellow fronted car goes through now, and a place has just been gained look, by the Grunt and Go Mustang. Marco Signoretti has got ahead of Cindy Goodey. So there it is, the Academy Motorsport Mustang. If there's a nicer sounding car on the grid, I've got to find it yet. But the uh, Mustang in its infancy, the sort of second generation GT4 Mustang, really going nicely here. Very different circuit from Alton Park on which it raced just under a week ago. Yeah, I don't think there could be two maybe more different tracks at all. But uh, yeah, the Mustang doing a, doing a decent job to get up to the 14th. It doesn't sound like much, but they haven't had the pace this weekend so far. So he'll be happy just to be able to pick some, something off get some positions, and it'll be really interesting to see if they can find some more pace for tomorrow's race. You've also just seen Alex Denning there getting ahead of Jem Hepworth's uh, McLaren. So switch between those two. Now there for uh, Tom Levin, trying to make progress through the traffic. 4.6 seconds remains the margin, and that's not really come down particularly, but even so, second first time out, Tom Levin, I think we'll be pretty content with that. But for the Toyota Gazoo Racing France squad, the Supra of Etienne Shelley, started by Enzo Julier, now just has to tick off the laps. It's their race to lose, isn't it? So the pace can be reduced if needs be, just to make sure that there are no errors. And uh, in that very Toyota-ish livery, the red and the black and the white sort of works colours, comes up towards the line, it looks a serious bit of kit. Uh, just perfect start to the season, this. No one can touch it. Certainly is, but this is an absolute key to look at GT racing where it's not just about the out-and-out -out pace, because actually the, the McLaren has looked a bit faster on this outright pace, but this has all been the hard work of first the Enzo Julie getting that start, getting the first bit of the lead, then he had a safety car, and then bang, straight into the lead. Since then, between him and Rattigan, it was relatively between 1.5 to 2 seconds. It didn't seem to ebb and flow too much. Then Shelley got in a bank, did a great outlap. So for if I'm elite now, I'm thinking, was there something we could have done a bit better? Can we turn the tires on a bit more? Are we lacking something just from straight out the box? Because it's not always as just who's the fastest on the lap. How can how fast can you make these outlaps and in laps count? You possibly just saw the team from NM Racing Team leaning over the pit wall, uh, trying to encourage Alex Papadopoulos to push on because he's only, two, there he is, he's only 2.7 seconds ahead of Antoine Leclerc. And last time, Leclerc was quickest by, quicker rather, by about a second and a half. There he is in the Alpine. So I reckon we've got time for one more lap at the end of this. But third for Leclerc could, could, could just be a possibility. Yeah, and I think he deserves it in a way, obviously not taking anything from NM or Papadopoulos. They've, read, they've raced a really good race. However, Leclerc has just been on it. And their tyres are obviously lasting really, really good on that small, nimble, light Alpine that he's driving. He looks to be someone that I would put a bet on to get still into the top three. It's just whether or not he can still make the pass, because it's one thing catching, as we always say, it's so hard to get past. Very true indeed. And Robert Consani is keeping Josh Miller at bay. There is Piana. And whoops, a mistake. Is that from the Mercedes getting out of the traffic, or is that a back marker letting them go? I think that's a back marker, isn't it? Letting the quicker Aston Martins go. Yeah, Jamie Day, Hendrick still go through. So the back marker sort of sacrificing himself there to let the faster cars go. Right, Papadopoulos in the first sector of 40.9. Leclerc takes half a second out in the first third of the lap alone. That is Jamie Day, that's Hendrik Still. They were covered by 0.328 of a second at the start of the lap. Hendrik Still has been around the GT4 scene for a long, long time. Knows exactly what he's doing. He was an outright winner at uh, Hockenheim last year. And he's hustling on in pursuit of Jamie Day for eighth overall. Yeah, really interesting to see the difference between these two Aston Martins as well. One of the new Evo cars that's just came out and then the other one, the slightly older one, but still not much between them. Is it really interesting? Sometimes you feel like you, know, you always want new. Newer is better, bigger is better. Everything's just great. However, the BOP doesn't 
mind that it doesn't see which one's new or old, it just sees the cars and it tries to balance it. And you can see how well a good of a job it's been doing of that. True enough. Right, leaders on the last lap, and the margin is now six and a half seconds between Etienne Shelley and then Tom Levin. Alex Papadopoulos go, goes through a second and a half only ahead of Antoine Leclerc. It's probably going to be too much for him to do, but it will be close, won't it, at the end? Certainly will be, yeah. It'll be really interesting. 1.5 seconds, look, he gained exactly that the last lap, or just under. So I'm thinking, if you're Leclerc, you're thinking, OK, I might not be able to get to him, but I could definitely put him under some pressure. Will Papadopoulos crack, or will he be cool and calm and just nice and steady, knowing that he can use the strengths of this Mercedes, which is lovely, nice and nimble through that tight and twisty corners, just think, OK, get yourself to sector three, don't let him to get too close, and just drive your own race. So Etienne Shelley then with this dream start to the season uh, coming up towards the end of the Mistral as along it to the chicane with the lights going. Antoine Leclerc just trying to distract Alex Papadopoulos hoping he might just look up at the wrong moment into the braking zone and make a mistake. But in fairness, Leclerc is almost there, isn't he? He's oh so nearly caught the Mercedes and they're heading towards a twiddly bit where the Alpine might have the advantage. So set to one, three tenths pull back. That's the race leader. Etienne Shelley having a pretty easy time of it thinking what he's going to have for dinner. He's almost at the end of the race. Uh, victory speech in mind. Far from easy. Look at this battle pack coming down towards uh, turn four up the curbs, over the curbs. Sideways Porsche contact. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Last lap three get together. And debris all over the road. So Etienne Shelley is on his way towards the line. I think I'm right in saying that was the uh, Jean-Laurent Navarro Porsche in the middle of all of that that's got the damage and is stranded so there's a yellow flag out but it matters not to Etienne Shelley and Enzo Julier who will come through to win round one of the GT4 European Series powered by Rafa Racing Club and what a start to the season a dominant display Tom Levin comes through for second in the elite motorsport McLaren shared with Josh Rattican good start to the season because they are much the uh, best McLaren team and for third place Alex Papadopoulos is just 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 gonna hang on his knee the margin as they come across the line is not quite side by side Papadopoulos defends and the margin as they came over the line was just a fifth of a second one more lap Leclerc would have done it but that was a really good push on the last lap and a real shame on the last tour as well. We had all that contact down at the bottom end of the circuit. It is, yeah, it's a shame. Just as we were saying, what such great clean race. And obviously, we still did. We had 49 cars start this race, and we had some absolutely fantastic racing up and down the field. But a big shout out to Antoine Leclerc there. What a race that he drove. What a stint he drove to claw back all that time and finish only two tenths off of third position as well. I think he'll be very proud of himself, albeit frustrated that he couldn't quite get by. So Etienne Shirley, Enzo Julier, the winners from Tom Levin and Josh Rattican. And then third, uh, a car that really flew under the radar a bit, to use that awful phrase, of Alex Papadopoulos and uh, Luke Ibanez that just chipped away, chipped away, and there it was as a podium finisher uh, in the end. In the uh, classes, the uh, Pro-Am competition in the end, won by Alexander Weintraub, uh, along with Stanislav Safranov, second in Pro-Am, Max Kronberg's Porsche number 30 that he shared with Finn Zulauf, who did the first stint, and then third. Uh, this is the... Re I'll come to third in a moment. This is the replay of what happened. That's Kevin Jimenez in the Aston on the inside, the former Renault Clio racer. Jean-Laurent Navarro's Porsche. He's 46. Uh, in fairness to Jimenez, he's kind of trying to steer away from the Porsche, isn't he? Navarro then gets run out wide over the kerb, and as he comes back, there's contact and that turns the Porsche across the front of the Aston, and at the same time, into the back of them all, goes Jem Hepworth in the Rafa Team McLaren. Ah, it's just such an awkward one there. I don't really put anyone at fault, necessarily. The Aston Martin had every right to look for the inside, but it's just so tight, so tight through Turn 5 there. The Porsche looked like it was just tagged, and it got a little bit loose on the kerb, and unfortunately, Jem Hepworth has just been the, uh, the total unlucky person through that, uh, that whole incident there. And Kevin Jimenez, um, kind of had a double whammy because of that contact and the time it cost him he dropped over 11 seconds away from Laurent Hergon so does not win the AM class with the penalty yeah I mean close as that isn't it yeah. so uh, it just shows doesn't it you have to just keep going all the way you never know what's going to happen in racing in general but especially this championship and towards the way to that last lap it just always keeps you on your toes but what a great job from Shelley there and uh, Enzo Julie.
So the Toyota wins by just under seven seconds in the end. Uh, not a wheel wrong, the car metronomic. It's always been a quick car, that. Last year it had one or two, but not necessarily this team operating it, but the car as a whole had the occasional mechanical woe. But uh, that was just absolutely rock solid. And Etienne Shelley brings the car home. The Elite Motorsport McLaren team for second. And that, Laurent Hergon, then, despite the penalty, wins Am with Pascal Huto. So the Alpines proving to be uh, quick cars. Antoine Leclerc shown as being in the pit lane. I wonder whether he had a problem at the end and peeled straight in at uh, the pit exit, but he's shown as having pitted to take the flag. And Kevin Jimenez has also now been given a 10 second penalty for causing a collision. So he's lost the AM lead, which he might have inherited. Uh, he's got a damaged car and now he's got a 10 second penalty. It will affect him overall. I think it keeps him second in class, but uh, there'll be frustration about that. Well, what a start to the season. Well, yeah, what a brilliant race. And like yeah. we said, for the for the majority of that, what great clean race as well. Battles all the way up and down the field in classic GT4 tradition. So, But you just got to say, the Toyota, Shelley, Julie, that, um, that won that, just absolutely sublime. Didn't put a foot wrong. The classic GT4 race win where you just want to go out, get in front, do your lap times and just disappear. Leban and Ratican, to be fair to them, tried to do a great job. And they were obviously the closest one to them but everybody else really far away. So those two cars at um, one and two there will be feeling great. Do you think this, it might be an unfair question this, but do you think there was a, a part of the elite uh, Leban decision towards the end to say, we're never gonna catch this Toyota, let's just settle, let's bank points for second, or is that the natural pace nearly seven seconds back? It's really difficult to say, obviously yeah. you go on best to best laps, you look at the uh, Rattigan there with fastest lap overall and you think, well, it, it can't have been, but also, like you say, it might just be a case of, look, we're not going to win this, get the car home, second still great start to the year, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, Tom Levin brought the car home, having been a single-seater racer most recently in GB3 and the uh, Formula Regionale series, so having to adapt to a GT car, but delight for Etienne Shelley and Enzo Julier. The uh, top three in the three classes will make their way to the podium. And thumbs up from Tom Levin. It's not a bad start to a, a GT career, is it? He will head over to the team. Eddie Ives there, the man behind Elite Motorsports. And uh, very much a family affair. Once you drive with Elite and Ginetta Juniors, you're kind of locked in, it seems, because he takes, takes you with him onto single-seaters because they have a GB3 team and then GT4 if you want to go that route as well. So it's a, a busy little enterprise, Elite Motorsport. So Tom Levin, there he is out of the car. Happy family, saying well done. And it'll be a podium first time out. And uh, the BRDC Rising Star badge you see on his overalls. One of the two schemes from the uh, club to look after and nurture young British talent. Right, Etienne Shelley and Zogilier, the winners. Let's join Antonia and our winning drivers. What a dominant display from both of you. You both really held your own. How does it feel? Well, uh, I think uh, it's unbelievable. First race, pole position, victory. It, it cannot be better. <laughs> yeah, we, we could not start better than that. And uh, yeah, very happy. Thanks to the team at Mute Evolution, TJRE, and uh, my mate Enzo, who did a fantastic job in the first team. So yeah, unbelievable. Well, what a fantastic way to start the season. Great job, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. They've set the bar pretty high, haven't they? Uh, the car was quick in the other qualifying session, so let's see whether a double is achievable tomorrow. But the Toyota would look hardly a mark on it, not even a fleck of rubber on the white paint on the sides. Just doing a tremendous job and a winning margin of 6.8 seconds. Let's next go to our Pro-Am winners because Alexander Weintraub and Stanislav Savronov have prevailed. Antonio is with them. Congratulations, guys. You really held your own out there today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We did our best, even though it was not easy at the end. Yeah. Thank you. It's a nice race. It's first race with Aston Martin, and uh, we're happy. Yeah. We're, thanks to the team for the car. Everything was great. <laughs> Brilliant. Well done, guys. Thank you. All smiles to happy drivers then. Alexander Weintraub uh, and Stanislav Safronov winning the Pro-Am competition. There is the victorious Aston Martin, and for them, a win first time out, new car as you were hearing uh, from the team. So uh, a really good result for those two drivers and they go into round two tomorrow as the championship leaders. And Laurent Hergon and Pascal Hutto, the uh, winners of the AM competition, uh, their Alpine 
in the end are benefiting from the dramas on that last lap and the two French drivers uh, are with Antonia. Guys, what a way to start this season. You must be thrilled. Yes, it was a very good race for us. It was difficult because we, we, we did a penalty during the, during the pit stop. So after that, we need to increase the, the level in, on track. So yes, we are very happy. It was very fun. Very good fight with the other concurrents. So I am very happy. And Pasquale did a very good, a very good stand to see. So it's, it's very good, very good. Uh, Laurent is a very good job. <laughs> Very, very good job. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Sign of good teamwork, that isn't it? Each praises the other. Uh, so, uh, Pascal Buteau and Laurent Hergant, the uh, victors then in the AM competition. And uh, we'll see how different tomorrow's result is going to be. It'll be a different grid. It's, it's based on a qualifying session, of course, not uh, on the results of this race, which uh, always makes for a, a, an intriguing situation. And it also means if you have a bad race one, you're not compromising to race two. Exactly, yeah, and for some of the guys that have been damaged or maybe had some contact in that race, gives all the boys tonight, all the mechanics, the boys and girls, to repair that car and get it out for the second race, because they might, like you say, be starting right at the sharp end of the grid. So, yeah, let's uh, let's hope that they can all have a good race tomorrow. The Matmut Evolution team, then, of Enzo Julier and Etienne Shelley are your winners. Second, Josh Ratkin and Tom Levin. Luke Ibaniev and Alex Papadopoulos for the podium third. Fourth, a little Alpine of Nelson Panchi, Tici and Antoine Leclerc from Benjamin Larich and Robert Consigny. And sixth in the end, that's a pretty good save, isn't it, for Beke Veschler and Gabriele Piana from uh, Matteo Villagomez and Jamie Day. Eighth uh, for Fabio Grauer and Hedrick Still. Ruben Del Sart, ninth with Josh Miller and Jagish Gedik and Pedro Ebrahim rounding out the top 10. 11th, the Pro-Am winning Stanislav Safronov and Alexander Ventrup. And 20th in the end, the Am winners, Pascal Hutto and Laurent Hergon. A little bit further down the order, some hard luck stories. Tom Enson and Alex Denning will probably say, had it not been for that turn one spin, we could have been more of a factor. Uh, had it not been for a punctured tyre, uh, Leo Pickler and uh, his co-driver, Herolind, Narodini with the Porsche could have been uh, more competitive as well and Kevin Jimenez with that last lap contact dropping down the order. Greg Gilva never got into the race and nor after problems in qualifying did Matthew Casalonga. So the teams have uh, some time to work on the cars for tomorrow. Let's look back at the best bits of race one. It began with that demon start by Enzo Julier making the run on the inside line all the way down to turn one and it was uh, Hugo Sasser trying to go with him and then it all kicked off in the mid-pack as the uh, McLaren of Tom Enson was turned around. That in turn was collected by the uh, Alpine of Laurence Lacuerta and with the wheel ripped off that car we had the safety car on the restart. Good progress by Nelson Panchi Tichi moving up on the inside at Sini to gain a place with Benjamin Larish on the back of that train and then he made his move and got through on the inside coming up towards the chicane. Those two would continue to trade places all the way to the end of the hour. Uh, on the pit stops, though, it was uh, a good effort made by Luke Ibaniev and Alex Papadopoulos because they gained places. The order had shuffled, of course, after the stops, and it would continue to shuffle into the second stint as Robert Consigny went through on the inside line in the Audi and kept on picking off places as the field reeled its way out of the chicane onto the Mistral straight. Off the road and back on again went Constantine, but the former rally man certainly knows how to defend and was able to hang on to the place. But disaster uh, for Raphael Renhofer as the suspension broke the wheel, trying to park company with the car. He limped the pit lane out of the race. No such dramas for Enzo Julier and uh, Etienne Shelley, who came through for a somewhat dominant race win. Checkered flag for the Matmut Evolution run. Toyota Gazoo Racing France entry. Toyota victorious as the podium ceremonies are underway and therefore third in Pro-Am, making their way up the steps. Gabriele Yokova and Cindy Goudé. And that car having a really good feisty run in both stints. So the all-female crew taking a podium finish there for second in Pro-Am. Uh, the Porsche drivers from WNS Motorsport, Finn Zulauf and Max Kronberg. Finn Zulauf new to the European series, moving from the... German equivalent to the German Championship. And then it's going to be Alexander Weintraub and Stanislav Safranov for the top step of the Pro-Am podium. Start with the Pro-Am uh, for a change, uh, rather than the overall, the Silvers. But there, the Mirage Racing team represented on the podium. Uh, and that means that there is one more step to fill, and that is for our winning drivers in Pro-Am. Stanislav Safranov, Alexander Weintraub, 
regulars in the championship, but uh, for them, a new car, and what a way to start the association with a class win. They make their way, having shaken hands with everybody, to the top step of the podium, and the national anthem for the winning team. So well done to the Mirage Racing team. Alexander Weintra of Stanislav Savranov then are winners as their Paige Morales, development driver and Rafa Racing Club ambassador will present the trophies. The Rafa Racing Club not only supporting this championship but also sim racing. It's a, a partner of the uh, Porsche Carrera Cup GB Esports Championship and Esports becoming ever more important uh, in motor racing, attracting people into the sport and then from sim racing to real world racing, but uh, still a very, very strong sim racing uh, community as well. So happy Pro-Am winners. And a job well done, keeping out of trouble and, and knowing who to race against, you know, not necessarily getting involved with the silver sacrifice and overall position, but keep your class lead. Exactly, yeah, it's always a tricky one. This is actually probably the trickiest part you can see. <laughs> Ready with some champagne and you never hate, you hate taking your, your finger off the top then because you think, well, I want to be ready, ready to go as soon as I can. And there we go. That's the most important part. They all had to pose for more photographs as well, but uh, now our class winners get a soaking. Gabriele Yalkova and Cindy Gouday have disappeared out of shot for the moment. Uh, the uh, other two thirds of the podium not being terribly gallant towards them, I fear. Nothing worse when you've only got one set of overalls for the weekend as well, so I can't blame the girls for, for jumping away there. Yeah, if ever you walk around a GT paddock and you see teams with a washing machine, you might think why, but there is a very good answer. Exactly. Worst problems to have, though, that's for sure. True enough, yeah. Means you've had a good day at the office. So the uh, podium is now dressed, ready for the next group of drivers. It's the top three out of the three classes. And as we were saying pre-race, everybody has something to fight for here. So there, more photographs being taken. Look down the steps as the teams are being uh, rustled up, made ready. And thumbs up from the SRO team down below. That means that the drivers can now be called forward. Still a busy afternoon of action at the Paul Ricard circuit here because there's a uh, mid-jet race to come and then the GT2 drivers have their second race of the weekend into the darkness and that will be uh, on the live stream later on as well on GT World. Right there goes Luki Banyev and Alex Papadopoulos were into the silver podium, so third overall, third in class. That Mercedes a bit of a sleeper in a way, it sort of crept almost unnoticed out of all the battles. A good pit stop as well, I think, helped them as well. Luke Ibanyev has been one of the leading lights of the series for a good few years now. There for second, up come Josh Rattigan and Tom Levin. The elite motorsport McLaren drivers taking second place. But what a start to the year for Enzo Julier and Etienne Shelley. The two French drivers then uh, will be on the top step, but the Matmut Evolution team represented, first of all, great reception for the winning team, and then for the drivers, for Enzo Julier and for Etienne Shelley. Really good first stint by Julier, who had to kind of do it twice after the safety car took away some of that lead. But it was barely a blip, was it, in the pace of the Toyota Supra as Etienne Shelley and Enzo Julier stand on the top step of the podium. Enzo Julier being congratulated by Luke Ibanez. Uh, the two of them two years ago drove together. So for the Matmut Evolution team, for Toyota Gazoo Racing France, and for Etienne Shelley and Enzo Julier, the French national anthem is played. 
and uh, a tremendous start to the uh, for the Toyota drivers. Right, as uh, Paige Morales steps forward to hand over the trophies, more of the same tomorrow, Charlie. But yeah, really good start to the year, that wasn't it? Great racing. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, everybody did a really good job all of the way up and down the field. So I, I enjoyed it. I think everyone at home hopefully enjoyed it, and I'm sure these two men in front of us are really enjoying it the most. True enough. Well, more of the same tomorrow. Race two for the GT4 European Series will be on our 10:55 local time tomorrow tomorrow uh, and we look forward to another uh, really lively race thanks for your company this afternoon from paul ricard from charlie fagg and david addison it's goodbye for now